Cassie. Okay, folks. Uh, let's get started. So my my plan for today is to continue the discussion of the PIO subsystem that we started a couple of lectures ago, and then really kind of got into the details of in that recorded lecture. And I want to, to my plan for today is to present a couple more PIO examples of familiar protocols. In particular, I want to look at a UART received implementation in PIO, and I want to look at an SPI implementation in PIO. And then with the remaining time, I want to talk through how the VGA standard works, how the VGA protocol works, so that we can then introduce the VGA PIO driver, and we'll sort of understand how it connects back to the standard. Um, and like I've said a couple of times, that's worth knowing because in order to get the most voids, you'll want to go in and make a slight modification to that VGA PIO driver. So after we talk through how that driver works, it'll be, I hope, clear precisely what modifications you'd have to make in order to get that to work. Um, before I do that, though, I wanted to take just a handful of minutes to tell you about this thing that we did with uh, spin launch. So what I have pictured on the screen here, this is, by the way, pretty much the only picture I was allowed to take. <laughs> uh, they were very strict about keeping phones in pockets, and fair enough. Um, but that said, they, their, their media people were all over the place, and they were going to put together a, a reel of the events of the day and share it with folks. So there should be some more picture and video of this stuff coming out relatively soon, I hope. But in any case, this is a picture of their suborbital accelerator. It's a little bit difficult to get a sense of scale here. There's a person right here. Um, so the circular part of this structure is 33 meters in diameter. The whole structure stands about as tall as the Statue of Liberty. Uh, it is out in a region of the New Mexico desert called Spaceport America. It's, very, it's right adjacent to the, the White Sands Missile Range, so there's not that much around. Um, Driving up to this thing was an experience <laughs> because there's something about the desert that confuses perspective. I don't know if folks have spent much time in desert places, but it can be difficult in those places to tell precisely how big things are until you get right up next to them. Um, the same thing is true, incidentally, on the moon where there's no humidity. The astronauts were having a lot of trouble when they were on the moon figuring out, is that a big boulder that's far away or a close boulder that's smaller? It actually was confusing. But in any case, a similar kind of thing can happen in the desert. So driving up, you could see this thing coming over the horizon, but it was difficult to tell precisely how big it is. And then you pull up close to it, and it's like, oh my god, it's huge. Um, pulling as, as soon as I pulled into the driveway of this thing, I got chills like the whole way down my body, which is a cool experience. I, I really like that feeling of getting chills, so I'm in the habit of paying attention to the things that give me chills, because I've been going through this exercise for the past few years of like, what's the pattern of the things that do that? Because I would really love to figure out how to engineer things that induce that sensation in people. Don't have any answers yet. Um, but, but what I have noticed is that the stuff that gives me chills tends to be, for reasons that I could speculate about, but that I don't really know, they tend to not be of the engineered variety. It tends to be music, it tends to be art, architecture, um, literature can sometimes do it. But for me, at least, and maybe this is just a me thing, it's very rarely an engineered system. Again, I, I have suspicions about that, but I'm not exactly sure. Um, this thing, however, is an exception. This, as soon as I pulled in, it was just absolute chills. And, you know, it, it was so bizarre because it's, it's this incredible example of mega engineering, huge engineering. And when I think of mega engineered stuff, my brain goes to like bridges and dams and this stuff that's really interesting and really important, but also familiar. This stuff kind of looks the same that it's looked for a long time. So it was just so interesting and inspiring to see an example of a mega engineered structure that was completely alien looking. I mean, it looked like it literally looks like the Millennium Falcon. I pulled up and I was like, oh my God, I'm on Tatooine. Like, this is insane. Um, so in any case, the the experiment that we conducted, I, I've, I've sort of summarized at a really high level how this mechanism works, but inside of this structure, they, they will pull a gentle vacuum, not a gentle vacuum, but not an incredibly hard vacuum on this whole interior to remove enough air so that they can spin an arm in here with a payload at the end incredibly fast. They spin it up, spin it up, spin it up, and then release it at just the right time for it to shoot out of this exit chute here. 
And so the experiment that we conducted was to put a few of these chipsets that I spent a lot of time working on um, inside of the launched projectile so that they would be launched along with the projectile up, up into the sky. And then when that projectile reached apogee, we would kick the chipsets out. They would free fall back down onto the desert floor. We would go find them. And the, the question that we were asking was a really simple one. It was just basically, did they survive? Um, the reason that this is an interesting question to ask is these chipsets are interesting from a research perspective and from a space exploration perspective because there's some really interesting mechanical and aerodynamic consequences of their size. So because they are so small, they are really mechanically rugged. Your, the, the beating that something can take as it scales down increases substantially. This is why you can flick an ant off the table and it'll hit the wall and hit the floor and then just walk away like nothing happened. <laughs> if, if some giant were to come up and flick us, we would just be a smear of red on the wall. We, our size does not accommodate for that kind of mechanical beating. Because these chipsets are so small, they can take a real beating before things start to go wrong. That's interesting from a planetary science perspective because suppose you're interested in studying the surface of some other planet or some other celestial body. The way that we've done that in the past is with things like rovers and getting a rover to the surface of a planet is really hard, really, really hard um, because you have to dissipate orbital energy relative to the planet to zero velocity relative to the planet in a very short amount of time without thermally overloading the system. But these chipsets are kind of interesting because, you know, they're so rugged that what if we just kind of shotgun them at the moon? and let them hit and didn't worry about entry, descent, and landing at all. They just crashed into the moon. Um, is there a non-negligible probability that some will survive? We don't need all of them to survive, right? Because they're so cheap, they're just printed circuit boards. We'll make a gajillion of them. But if there's a non-negligible probability that some survive, then maybe this is a reasonable mechanism by which we can get sensors onto the surfaces of other planets. And then once they're there, the data set that they generate is really interesting because they'll spread out over quite a large area. So you get from the collective, you get a data set with the spatial breadth that you typically only associate with remote sensing, right? With some camera or radar unit that's sitting on an orbiting spacecraft that can see a big swath of land. You get that kind of breadth, but the measurements that you get are from sensors that are right up close to the thing that they're measuring. The term for that is in situ. It's an in situ measurement which you typically only associate with rovers. And the fact that orbiting spacecraft with remote sensors exist and rovers exist suggests that there's values to both kinds of data sets, right? And these chipsets could offer a unique combination of these things. You get the spatial breadth that you typically only associate with remote sensing. You get the local in situ depth that you typically only associate with rovers. But in, in order to actually plan and conduct missions of that variety, we have to understand a lot of things. One of the things that we have to understand if we're trying to explore a planetary body with an atmosphere is what are the paths that these things take from the top of the atmosphere down to the surface? So you can imagine it's a printed circuit board. So they behave kind of approximately like a piece of notebook paper that you might drop that sort of flips and turns and in a mathematically chaotic way. So Figuring out, you know, if there's some region of interest that you want to get sensors to, maybe a crack in the ice in Europa, how well can you hit that target, right? Or suppose you have some release ellipse at the top of the atmosphere. What's the size of the landing ellipse that these chipsets assume by the time that they get to the surface? We need to know that so that we know how many do we need to deploy in order to get a sufficient number into some region that we care about. So this was the first test in that direction. Right, so the point of this test, as I just suggested, was do they survive? And now that we've confirmed, by the way, that they do, they work just fine, what we can now start doing is deploying lots of them at incredibly high altitude and studying how they flip and turn on the way down, trying to get a sense of this chaotic motion that they're, uh, that they're doing, the size of the landing ellipse. And then maybe starting to do experiments like how, how could we maybe add some determinism to those trajectories? Are there clever mechanical ways that we could make the paths that they take a lot more predictable or perhaps even control them? Maybe could you introduce a spin. Could you, could you give a chipset a preferred direction of flight? Could you do this purely 
are, you, are folks familiar with Breitenberg vehicles? This is something that I've been, yeah, we, we were talking about it the other day. Um, I've just, this is just a hallucination, but something I've been pondering. Breitenberg vehicles are these really interesting robotic systems. They're old, um, old in the sense that people have been thinking about them for a while. But an example of a Breitenberg vehicle is a little robot. There's a motor controlling each wheel, and the current through each of those motors is controlled by a phototransistor connected to each. So you can imagine that maybe you, you connect. It's up to you, basically, which phototransistor you connect to which motor. But you know, there's one connected to each motor. So there's no brain on this robot. There's no processor. But if you shine a light at it, depending how you have the phototransistors hooked up to the motor, it will exhibit some emergent behavior that appears intelligent. It may, for instance, run towards your light. Or if you have it wired in a different way, maybe it runs away from the light. Or maybe it starts to orbit your light. That's interesting for a lot of reasons, because that's a complex behavior, actually. That's a complex emergent behavior, one that looks really intelligent, but there's no brain. And it's kind of interesting biologically, because maybe this is how bugs work. Maybe. Maybe their sensors are wired directly to their actuators. Um, but in any case, wouldn't it be interesting to develop a version of a chipset that just flew towards the sun? I think that would be kind of cool. Um, so I, I'm really excited about this whole, the success of this whole experiment, because the sorts of experiments that now are reasonable, that we, we've proven that we could conduct are really exciting. Um, it was very cool. It came out, I, I'm not sure if I'm supposed to disclose precisely how fast this came out, but I will, I can say that it came out fast enough that there was a really dramatic sonic boom when it came out the top of this thing. Um, and a very dramatic sound when it came back down as well. It came back down and embedded itself in the ground and then we went and found it. Yeah. What was the apex? Are you allowed to say that? I don't know. I don't know. They're, they're going to release a video about the whole thing. I just want to be cautious not to, you know, say anything I'm not supposed to, but I'm, I'm sure it'll be in the video. If you want to learn a lot more about this company and this system, there's a, a YouTube documentary from the channel Real Engineering, which maybe some of you are familiar with. It's about 40 minutes long. Um, but they go into tremendous detail about how this whole thing works. One of the engineering challenges I'll just really briefly mention before moving on to the actual content is uh, how do you prevent the shock wave from propagating back down into the chamber? It's out with really fast doors. <laughs> so the projectile goes up and really fast doors close to prevent that shock wave from propagating back into the chamber and works beautifully. Okay. Sorry. Does it have the power to read the atmosphere? Um, this is, if you can believe it, in their mind, a little scale model of what they're ultimately building. This is 33 meters in diameter. This is to just kind of figure out how stuff works so that they can build a version of this that is 100 meters in diameter. <laughs> um, and the one that's 100 meters in diameter will launch stuff really, really fast. Um, one of the kind of interesting things, I mean, the, the physics that describes this process is not complicated, really. I mean, there's some complicated engineering challenges to solve here, obviously, but the fundamental physics underlying how this works is stuff that you all, I mean, we were all kind of introduced to probably freshman year or so, it's just rotational dynamics. But one of the interesting consequences of making this thing bigger is in order, all that matters, you can imagine, is the tip speed of the rotating thing. That's all you care about. If the arm is longer, the Gs are less, right? So, so some problems actually simplify as you scale this thing up. A couple of problems maybe get a little bit harder, but a lot of the problems get easier as the thing gets bigger. How big would it have to be to launch people? <laughs> <laughs> Probably pretty big. Uh, so in any case, it was it was a very successful day. It was really inspiring to see you know something like this. It's 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 cool to see something that's just new. This is just new. Very cool. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, so you mentioned like the next step would be figuring out how is it going to land and like how is it going to like disperse in the air. I, like this could just be like not understanding mechanical engineering, but could you like simulate most of that? 
Yeah, you certainly could. And, and the simulations can get you, you know, you can learn a lot from them. It gets really hard to make simulations of things like interactions with atmosphere that are sophisticated enough to convince someone to, to do something expensive with that. Um, it's, it's a similar problem, incidentally, to there are a lot of people that study hypersonic parachutes. So these are the sorts of parachutes that are used for, you know, say the Mars rover is, is entering the Martian atmosphere. They will deploy a hypersonic parachute that, throw, that slows the whole system down from crazy, crazy high speeds to just crazy high speeds. So they're still going incredibly fast, but that parachute is interacting with the atmosphere at hypersonic velocities. You can develop models of that, and there are lots of people that, that do develop very sophisticated models of these things. But always, 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 for the parachute in particular, they conduct experiments. And the nature of the experiments that they conduct is shoot a sounding rocket, that is to say a rocket that doesn't enter orbit, but this just goes up really high, really fast, and then comes back down up to the region of the atmosphere where the atmospheric density is approximately the same as on Mars. And then they will release the parachute at hypersonic velocities in atmosphere with about the right density and point a camera out the back of the vehicle at it and just watch what happens. Because it is such a complicated dynamic system and there's an element of chaos in there that's difficult to predict um, that in order to really convince yourself it's going to work, you got to do the experiments. And, and, and I think it's appropriate to put this kind of thing approximately in that category as well. We could probably get a pretty good sense of, well, maybe. Maybe we could get a pretty good sense of exactly what's going to happen with these things. But I wouldn't feel very confident in those models until I saw it verified by an experiment. Not for interaction with atmosphere and flipping and turning and all this crazy stuff. Um, could you change the design so that it was a lot more modelable? Probably. Probably that's worth doing. Um, but even so, there's, there's a lot of stuff going on up there that's hard to capture in a model. And I'm not sure what is OK to omit from that model. Maybe there are people that do, but I don't know. Any other questions? Yeah. Do you know how they're funding this? You can ask them. I don't know. <laughs> OK, in that case, let's get back to the RP2040. Um, did anybody have any questions about the recorded lecture? Which, by the way, was 75 minutes long. And that's because I started the lecture, and I forgot to start a timer. And I thought, I know how long 45 minutes is. And then I stopped, and it was 75 minutes later. So hopefully you like watched at 1.5 speed or something. Um, but in any case, did, are there any questions about any of that? Okay. If any occur to you as I go through this, just let me know. I'll just remind you that what, what was presented in that lecture was, first of all, a review of some of that content that we really rapidly went over a few lectures ago, the instruction set for the PIO coprocessors, and then an attempt to make some of these abstract ideas a little bit more concrete by looking at actual examples that implement familiar protocols. So we, the, the first thing that was presented in that lecture was the Hello PIO example from Raspberry Pi, which is just a very simple example. Simple in that there's not much going on. Um, it doesn't do that much, but, but it demonstrates how we set up communication between the ARM and these PIO systems. So first was that, and then the next thing that was presented was a PIO implementation of a UART transmitter. So unless there are any questions about that, the next thing that I wanted to look at was a PIO implementation of a UART receiver. And I want to look at this because it demonstrates a couple of instructions that we haven't seen used in an actual example yet. A couple of those nine instructions that compose the whole instruction set. So let me just pull up. Oh, why not? Hold on, stand by. Um, okay. So I want to pull up a couple more examples from this 
repository of examples that's put together by the Raspberry Pi company. I'll just remind you that we were in the PIO directory here. The examples that we looked at in that lecture were Hello PIO and UART TX. And I'd like to take a look at UART RX. Um, I'm going to pull up the PIO program here. And then let me also just briefly remind you how this protocol works. We, we talked about this already, but UART is a really simple, really old protocol. So the device that wants to send a transmission, it starts by pulling the transmit line, which is idle high, down low for a bit time. That's the start bit. And this is the signal to the device that's going to receive the transmission to start its clock. And then once per bit time, it just puts a one or a zero out on that transmit line. And because we have sync, we have phase locked the receiver's clock with the transmitter's clock, the receiver will sample the voltage on this data line at the appropriate times in order to get the full packet off of the uh, its receive line. And then of course it ends with a stop bit. Okay. Old protocol, slow protocol. So we looked last time at the transmitter and I want to just quickly look at, I want to quickly look at a PIO implementation of a UART receiver. And the whole program lives here. You can see that as, as before, the program starts with a dot program and then the name of the program. In this case, it's UART RX mini. And the first instruction here is wait zero pin zero, which is to say, wait for a logical zero on pin zero. This is us waiting for the start bit. So this PIO program will pause here and wait on this instruction until pin zero, and we'll, we'll configure which pin that is, uh, but until this pin goes low, which is the indication that a start bit has just the, the edge of that start bit has appeared. The next thing that it then does is call the set command, which you'll remember allows for you to, to assign data to a particular destination. We set the X register to a value of seven, and then we delay for 10 PIO cycles. Why 10? We're implementing a UART channel that, that assumes eight PIO cycles per bit. And by setting the clock divider, we can make that a particular baud rate, but we're, we're assuming eight PIO cycles per bit. We're delaying for 10 PIO cycles so that when we go and sample the voltage on our input pin, we are somewhere in like the middle of the bit. So we're set, we're, we don't want to sample as the data is changing or even sort of near to this in case there's any desynchronization. We want to sample when we're comfortably in the middle of a bit. So we delay for an amount of cycles that puts us about in the middle of the bit. The next thing that we do is call an in instruction. You remember that what in does is it moves data from some user specified source into the input shift register. And in this case, we're moving data from the pins to the input shift register. And in particular, we're moving one bit from the pins into the input shift register. We then ex execute a jump instruction. So we say in the event that X is the, the value in the X scratch register is non-zero, jump back up to bit loop, but wait six cycles before you do, you do so. Why six cycles? Because there's eight PIO cycles per bit. We've spent one here. We've spent one evaluating this and then we delay for six more. So this puts us right in the middle of the next bit in the serialized output when we sample the input pin again. So in the event that the X scratch register is non-zero, execute this jump. And before you do, decrement the value of that X scratch register. So the first time through here, we're going to say jump if X is non-zero to bit loop. X will have a value of seven. It'll execute this jump and decrement, decrement X to six. Five, four, three, two, one, until we get all eight bits. And what you don't see here, remember I, I talked last time about these little tricks that allow for you to save an instruction or two. In particular, I talked about program wrapping, which allows for you to save yourself a jump instruction. And I talked about auto push and auto pull, which allow for you to save push and pull instructions. 
And the way that these work is in the case of auto push, it is counting the number of bits that have been shifted into the input shift register. And when that number hits a user programmable threshold, it automatically pushes that out to the RX FIFO so that it is obtainable by the CPU, either through an SDK command or through uh, a DMA channel. So if we look down here, what we find is some familiar looking stuff. So we're setting the pin directions for the pin to input in this case. We're initializing the particular pin that we're configuring as an, as an input such that it is being manipulated by the, the PIO subsystem and we're turning on a pull up. But what I wanted to point out here is this configuration command that sets up the input shift register. There are a few arguments here. Um, one of them, I believe it's this third argument, specifies whether auto push is on or off. <coughs> Having this set to true says that we want auto push on. And then this final argument is that threshold value number of bits at which the push should occur. So in this case, we're saying every time you count eight bits as having been shifted into the input shift register, push that out to the RX FIFO and zero the input shift counter again, and then start counting up once more. So that means after we get eight bits, which is one UR transaction, it's one character, that character will get put out to the RX FIFO so that we can go retrieve it from the arms. And as I, as I mentioned, this is where we are setting the baud rate so that we have eight PIO cycles per bit time. The bit time is being specified here by the baud rate. So we're configuring the clock there. What was the upper limit on that parameter? On the auto push parameter? Yeah. 32. Well, what happens if you input something above that? Does it just bring it back down to 32? Like if you try to make, if you try to put a 33 here or something? I, I don't know what error it throws or if it does. Do you know, Bruce? I think it wraps back to one. Makes sense. Confusing. Makes sense. So this is, this is a as simple as it gets version of a UART receiver. Further down here, there's another PIO program that uh, keeps an eye out for some of those error conditions that we talked about when we were talking about UART. So remember that we talked about the various uh, error messages that you might see on a UART channel include things like framing errors, uh, might include a, a stop condition, looks like a framing error. This is a method by which you can catch some of those errors. So you can see the first part of this looks, looks exactly the same. We're waiting for the start condition, the start bit rather setting X to seven and waiting for 10 PIO cycles so that we're right in the middle of that bit time. We then go through and get the value on the input pin, jump back to bit loop, you know, exactly as we did before. And then we execute another jump instruction. This time we're jumping on the condition of the pin to a place in code labeled good stop. So what this is saying is in the event that the input pin is high, a logical one, then jump to this place in the program, which will execute a push that moves that data out to the RX FIFO to be received by the channel. Because we're expecting to see the stop condition here. So we're expecting that this pin is high. If it is high, then great. We just push that character out back to the, to the user. In the event that this pin is low, we pass through this jump instruction because the logical condition under which the jump occurs isn't met. And instead, we throw an interrupt and we wait for the line to return back to an idle state. That is to say, we wait for the line to go high again, at which point we jump back to the start and just wait for another character without ever actually pushing it back to the user. So this is a mechanism by which we are enforcing that we only make available to the users those characters for which we did not detect any framing errors. We saw the stop bit when we expected to see the stop bit. And if we didn't, we didn't provide that information back to the user. We just went back and waited for the next character. Um, and we, but we did signal to, the, to you know, the system that there was an error. So the system would be able to see this interrupt and say, oh, we just tried to receive a UART transmission, but it was screwed up. 
So we didn't get anything. Okay, questions about that? Yes. Does it detect a case where the lost data you sent is actually um, high so that even there's a Vermeero, you're like if there's no Vermeero, or if there is, then you're detecting the correct data, but you're saying there's a bad, uh, wait, uh, so, so it assumes that there are eight data bits. So it assumes that there's a start bit, eight data bits, and a stop bit. If the transmitter were to send a packet of a different size, then we would have to modify this because then, yes, indeed, it might confuse a data bit for a, a stop bit or something like that. But, but this, this assumes that the, the transmitter and the receiver in this case must agree on the size of each data packet and on the data rate. Other questions? Yeah. Why the like stop the indicates uh, framing error? So a framing error, all that a framing error means is we didn't see the stop bit when we expected to see the stop bit. So which is to say, you know, we, we receive eight bits, eight data bits. So we receive a start bit, eight data bits. We expect for the next bit to be a one. That is the stop bit. If we instead notice that it's a zero, then we know that a framing error has occurred. Yeah. If it was like there was a framing error, but the data is one. You would not catch it. Um, some UART channels allow for a parity mode so that one of the bits that's sent is the parity of the data bits. In that case, you might be able to catch some of these more subtle errors, right? In that case, you, if one of your data bits flipped, so it changed the parity of the data, then you would be able to detect that. Another way to check errors is, which a lot of, of UARTs do, is to sample each bit either four or eight times they all have to agree. Which gives you a lot of more redundancy. You could program that to the, you could reprogram this to do that check also. Okay. So then I, I want to look at one more one more example from Raspberry Pi, which is SPI. This is a quick one. So let's look at this. This .pio file contains a bunch of different PIO programs that implement different versions of SPI. Remember, I talked about how there are different modes here. There's a, uh, the degrees of freedom in an SPI channel is are, is the clock idle high, active low, or idle low, active high, and is the data valid on rising clock edges or falling clock edges? So in this file, there are a few examples of different implementations of an SPI channel in PIO that implement those various different modes. And there's also an example further down that implements the chip select line as well. The example that I'm going to present assumes that the user is, is clearing and resetting the chip select line from the arm, which is to say, you know, I'm the arm, I want to send an SPI transaction to some device. I first do a GPIO put of some GPIO pin that I'm using as chip select zero. I then send data to the PIO state machine that I'm about to describe. And then in software, again, I would put the GPIO, I, I would, I would um, reassert the chip select line in software. Like I said, I don't think we'll look at it today, but if you care to, further down in this file, there's an example of a PIO program that automatically toggles the chip select line within the program as well. I just want to look at this example here, this is an example of um, an implementation of a, an SPI channel that is clock phase zero and for which data is valid on rising clock edges. 
this demonstrates a few things that we've already talked about. So, so up there, line 14, you can see that we have a dot program and then the name of the PIO program that we're about to look at. This one's called SPI CPHA0, which is just to say mode 00, um, idle low, active high, and valid on rising clock edges. And the whole program is these two lines of code. So you can see that the first thing that we do is we call out pins one, that is to say, move one bit from the output shift register out to the pins. Oh, and also side zero, this is a side set command. So simultaneously with moving those, that single bit from the output shift register out to the pins, also set the pin which we've configured as the side set pin to zero. The pin that we're manipulating with the out command is going to be our MOSI line. The pin that we're manipulating with the side set command is our clock line. The next thing that we do is call in pins one. So from a separate set of pins that we've mapped to the in instruction, we're shifting one bit from that pin, in this case, into the input shift register, and simultaneously side one, which is to say, at the same time that you're doing this, please also set the GPIO pin that's mapped to the side set command to a one. And then wait for a cycle in each case. So what this is doing is reading the value on the input pin, the um, MISO line, simultaneously with putting a rising clock edge on the clock line. So we are sampling the data on the data line at the rising clock edge. So this, this I hope is demonstrating what's so useful about these side set configurations. If you're, if you're interested in sampling data on rising clock edges or on falling clock edges, it's really convenient to be able to manipulate the clock line with side set while at the same time putting data out or putting data or pulling data in from the data lines. And again, a couple of commands that you don't see here are a pull command. A pull, you'll remember, pulls data from the TX FIFO into this output shift register that we're actually moving data from out to the pins. We don't see that. We also don't see a push command, which moves data from this input shift register out to the RX FIFO to be received by the processors. And we don't see those because we've implemented auto push and auto pull. And we've configured auto push and auto pull, if we look down here just a little bit further, uh, to as an argument to this, we pass in an argument called n bits, somewhere here, n bits. This is the number of bits that we want to send or receive per SPI transaction. So in the case that we were going to talk to the DAC through this PIO implementation of an SPI channel, that would be 16 because the DAC expects 16 bit transactions. It may alternatively be, I don't know, a 32 if the device that you're communicating with expects 32 bit transactions or an eight or whatever it is. But in any case, you can see that we are setting the input and output shift register configuration such that auto pull is enabled, auto push is enabled, and they automatically pull and push when they have counted n bits number of bits being shifted out of the output shift register or n bits number of bits being shifted into the input shift register. So suppose we set that to 16, then we would shift 16 bits out of the output shift register. As soon as we've counted that number of bits as having been shifted out, we would pull in 16 more bits into the output shift register and do it again. And then likewise for shifting from moving data from the input shift register out to the RX FIFO. Make sense? So it's kind of interesting, right? I, a, a whole SPI channel sans chip select, but okay, is two lines of a PIO program. And as I've mentioned a few times, the PIO subsystem on the RP2040 can touch every GPIO port and you have full configurability with regard to which pins you want for a particular program to touch with the out command, the in command, the side set command. So if you didn't like 
the, uh, if you didn't like the GPIO pins to which the SPI peripheral was mapped, you can build your own new SPI channel in PIO and put them on whatever GPIO pins you want. Or if you want more SPI channels, there are two SPI peripherals, but you want, I don't know, five, you can build yourself a few more and put them on whatever pins you want to put them on. You could build yourself more, more UART channels. You could build yourself I2C channels. We won't go over that example, but there is an example of that in here. Yeah. Is the Pico SPK using PIO to mapping the GPIO pins? What's the question? Is the Pico SPK using PIO to mapping uh, SPI or I2C to the GPIOs? For the, those dedicated peripherals, like the SPI peripheral and the I2C peripheral? No, th those peripherals are dedicated SPI or I2C peripherals that we, we could also map to some subset of the GPIO pins, but only to a subset. The PIOs, we can map to any GPIO that we want. Okay. Any other questions about this? Is it kind of becoming clear how interesting this is? And I, I mean, it's, it introduces a lot of flexibility um, almost an overwhelming amount. <laughs> the, the, the amount of stuff that you can do with this is, is a little bit overwhelming. Okay, so, so then the exercise that we've been going through is taking a look at a communication protocol. Maybe it's UART, maybe it's SPI. Learning how the protocol works and then looking at that protocol's implementation in PIO so that we can see the mapping that's taking place. So this whole last few lectures has been building up to a particular protocol that is of use to you in lab two, which is VGA. So the next thing that I want to do is talk through how that protocol works, how that communication channel actually operates. And then we'll, just like we've already done for UART and for SPI, we'll look at its implementation in one of these PIO programs so that perhaps it's clear how you can modify it. 